This is the Monday, March 27th, 2023 meeting of the Historical Commission, Northampton Historical Commission. And as we all know, we are meeting remotely and the meeting is being recorded. Um, to begin the meeting, if there is any member of the public here who would like to offer comment on any item that is not already on the agenda, um, we would be happy to take comments now. And um, if you do have a comment, please uh, identify yourself and your address. And uh, okay, so I have Jacqueline. Uh, yes, there I've unmuted. Uh, at, I can't stay for the whole meeting because there's something else going on at Planning and Sustainability about a project, um, affordable housing project. But I would like to ask if you could, after comments, speak to your next meeting. I understand from the last meeting that you're expecting to have a joint meeting soon with the Planning Board to discuss the Barrett Planning Group report. What is the current status of that? Sarah, that's, do you want to comment on that? Sure. So it, uh, that's definitely still the plan. We don't know the exact date, but it will most likely be uh, end of April or early May. So more, more to come on that. And that will be at one of the planning boards. Okay, so that's, there's been no changes. Thank you. Yep. Okay, great. Um, anybody else? All right. Uh, I do have a brief chair's report, um, two items of interest. One is that um, you may or may have not heard that Harvey has had to resign his uh, position on the commission. He um, has a regular obligation now in the evening um, that is keeping them from coming to these meetings on Monday. So he's officially resigned his uh, seat and um, we wished him well and thanked him for his service. If any of you have any ideas or others you think might be good members of the commission, please encourage them to um, file papers, or I should say uh, web-based papers <laughs> through the mayor's office. Um, we had, So we are down to five members, which is not great. And um, we really like to have a seven member full slate of um, participants. So that would be great if you could do that. And I'll be doing, I'll be thinking the same. And the second item is I just wanted to let everyone know that um, you probably or maybe don't recall our last few meetings. We've had um, appearances by applicants to the most recent round of the Community Reservation Committee's um, funding cycle. It's our spring cycle, which is a little bit of a truncated cycle. It's kind of the leftovers of the whole year of funding. Um, we did have, I believe, about $600,000 to give away, which is great. It was unusual. And each of the projects that we funded um, fell into the historic reservation category. So that would be, um, if you recall, Historic Northampton uh, had applied to do an assessment of their costume textile collection and furniture. And um, that was fully funded. So that will be really exciting to see happening coming up. Um, Lynn, Lynn um, Bassett is going to be coming back <laughs> to uh, work on that, which is great because she's an old time historic Northampton uh, person and she's one of the best textile experts, at least in this part of the country and probably beyond. So that's fabulous. Um, the second one was um, the Smith Charities building. Um, they are continuing to restore their facade, as you all probably remember, and um, that uh, the, commu the committee had a number of questions about their long-term plans for, uh, for sustaining that building. Um, they don't have a revenue stream, and so we made some very clear recommendations about that they need to really come up with a strategic plan for trying to finance future um, you know, maintenance, um, not only of the interior, but also the, ex not only the exterior, but also the interior. It's a very old building and they've struggled with that in the past. And it's such an important um, feature in the Northampton, you know, street, downtown streetscape. So um, that was also fully funded, but we also placed it sort of 
uh, not a restriction, but a, a, with a caveat, I guess I would say. Third project, Sarah. <laughs> Don't <laughs> me forget. <laughs> I meant, meant to write these down before, and I didn't have a chance to. What is? I was just doing dealing with things from the previous <laughs> round, so uh, I'm a little mixed up. I get, give me one second. Forbes Library. I'll tell you. Yes. The, the, oh, yes. <laughs> thank you, Dylan. All right. <laughs> yes, the Forbes Library. This was not an applicant that came to us for review ahead of time, which is fine. Um, I, we'd like to see that, and I'm trying to get that to happen each round because um, I think it's important that we know what's going on and we endorse them. Um, but this was a project to upgrade the ventilation systems in the Ford li Ford's library bathrooms. Um, if any of you folks have used the bathroom, now Dylan, you work there, so I'm sure you're well aware. Um, there was a 1998 restoration done that included the bathrooms, and I, I'm still perplexed about this, but somehow um, the bathroom renovations did not meet code, but they a uh, library was able to get a certificate of occupancy. A little perplexing. Um, and um, so what's happened over that period, you know, decades period is um, they've been increasingly uh, annoying in the sense that they don't ventilate very well. And as you know, you know, the library is a public amenity in the city. It, it is a library and a, um, a lending institution and also a presidential library and a gallery and a historical repository, mm -hmm. but it also is used by a lot of um, people who are less fortunate um, and use the bathrooms for personal hygiene. And so it's really come to the attention to the library, um, both the staff and patrons that this needs to be resolved. Um, I, I did feel, and I think I hopefully properly represented all of you that they were taking the right approach to it. Um, they had a very good plan for ventilating without, um, having to build a lot of exterior uh, visible um, uh, utility shoot um, chases and that kind of thing. So the ventilation will be concealed. Um, so I, I felt pretty confident about that. Um, but there was a lot of discussion about whether, you know, this is really eligible. Um, it is a historic building, obviously a really important cultural resource, um, but, um, you know, is it maintenance? Why didn't it you know, why didn't it meet code the first time and how were they able to get in there? So, um, but we did decide to fully fund it. So in the future, if you go to the library in the next year or so, you should have a more pleasant experience taking care of your personal duties. And uh, a broader interest of the Historical Commission also was the city solicitor's opinion that um, as long as the work meets uh, the Secretary of the Interior standards and is being done for any type of code improvement of any kind, that work would be eligible for CPA funding. Oh, great. So, so that's that, not, that, that, okay. that could potentially be applied to projects that had previously sort of been considered not really el eligible for CPA funding. Great. OK, so that you'll announce that on Wednesday night? Yeah. Yep. Great. Perfect. Yeah, because we were concerned about that. So a lot of good stuff going on um, in our, our realm. Um, we do have a set of minutes to approve. And this was interesting. I thought looking back on this was that long discussion about the uh, carriage house on um, Lily Street. Does every of you remember that? Yeah. November 28th, uh, 2022. Um, does, does anyone have any comments on this? Do they have any changes? Um, I think I think the minutes looked OK. OK. Anybody else? Um, a mo motion to approve? Yeah, I would move, move to approve them. I'll second. Okay. No more discussion. Um, we need to take a vote. Okay. And roll call vote for those. Steve? Yes. Dylan? Yes. Barbara? Yes. And Martha? Yes. Okay. Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, great. We have two uh, demolition review ordinance applications in front of us tonight, the first of which is on College Lane. These are both um, applications that have been filed by the by Smith College. And um, I think before, I know I'm beginning to sound like a broken record. And if you can tell me um, to revise my way of approaching this, I'm happy to hear it. But I'm thinking that um, because these are similar, I would like to just review with everyone the, um, the evidence that we need to consider in order to make a decision about both, both of these, whether they should be significantly 
they are, uh, we want to determine them to be significant pursuant to the ordinance. And I'll just go through those quickly again. Um, this is partly for the record um, so that uh, everyone who's not a commission member knows what we're thinking about. So I will go through them. Um, one is the first, uh, is the current condition of the building. What is that, the building or structure? Um, how intact is the building or structure? What is its age? Is the building or structure an exemplary representation of a certain style or period? And if so, how many of those exist? What is the building or structure's role in the streetscape? Are there exemplary construction elements that embody distinctive characteristics of a period? Does the building or structure yield information important to history? Has the building or structure been designed by a famous and or local architect? Has the building or structure been removed from its original location? And if so, does it still have architectural value? Or is the surviving structure importantly associated with a historic person or event? And just uh, considering all of those, if we de determine as a group uh, either building to, uh, should be preferably preserved, then we have um, the option of placing up to 12 month delay on one or both. Uh, but at this point, we need to discuss whether we believe this is, um, should, these should be preferably preserved. And then I think we should take each one of them individually because they are, they are <clears throat> part, you know, adjacent to Smith College or part of Smith College, I guess, but not in the same location. Um, I, um, as in the past, need to recuse myself as a current employee of the college to avoid conflict. Right. Interest, so. Okay, that's fine. We that's still, fine. thank you, Steve. Let, let everybody know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and I, um, but we, we are down to a quorum of three because we only have five members now. So uh, we, there are three of us here, which is great. And maybe four if Greg joins us. Okay. Um, I, I did find out some information on eight college lane. Can, right. Can I can I share that? Because I, I didn't Please get do. it so very yep. recently. I contacted um, Nancy Young, the college archivist, mm -hmm. and she gave me some information that um, eight college lane was part of the property which Dwight Look uh, purchased in 1891, and these are the looks of Look Park. Um, I believe in 1920, his daughter sold the property, and the uh, buildings there on to Smith. Um, the college, uh, the main house became Park Annex, which is um, uh, on College Lane, just a little further up from this eight, eight College Lane. Um, and um, and wait a minute, there's something about some barns, sorry, that isn't connected. But there's a man, George W. King, who worked at Smith between 1921 and 1956, he was assistant superintendent of buildings and grounds under his father, Franklin King Jr. Um, he and uh, he lived, he and his family lived at 8 College Lane until his death in 1956. So this is the, um, well, the assistant and then later the superintendent of grounds. And then the next superintendent of grounds named Paul Davis um, lived there um, until 1968 when he moved. And uh, Nancy couldn't, um, she lost the thread as to who occupied eight college lane uh, but after 1968, but around the 20 teens, it was renovated and it's been used as an alumni, as an admissions office annex. I think they now have a conference room in there. It's across from the um, admissions building, which Smith also applied for uh, demolition. I think we found that preferably preserved uh, the building across the street. Um, so that's to say that this building certainly has you know, a hundred year history of occupation of, I feel are significant people uh, at Smith. And before that, uh, the building, the property and some of those buildings belong to another prominent Northampton family. Um, so I think that um, uh, could be grounds for finding it preferably preserved. Barbara, um, just a question about that. So, um... You said it was part of the Dwight Look, uh, you know, uh, whole land holdings and sold uh -huh. to 
and the daughter sold it to Smith and 21. Was the house built? When was the house built? Do we know? Well, part, you know, I, I meant to look up Park Annex, that main house. I think it's earlier than that. I could look it up, but because um, I have a, uh, well, maybe when somebody else is talking, I'll go get this book that would tell us when that house was built. Um, and, uh, but I'm not sure, I don't think we really know when this smaller house, the, um, this building at 8 College Lane was built. Mm -hmm. But um, presumably it was there at least in 1920 when um, George King and his family lived there, the, super, the intendant, superintendent of buildings and grounds. <coughs> Excuse me. It, it first appeared on the 1930 Sanborn map. So that, that seems about right. Which one, Park Annex or 8 College Lane? 8 College. Um, and the, the prior Sanborn map to that was 19... 15, uh, mm -hmm. so sometime in between right. those. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna go get my book. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Yes, and I wanted to also mention that there are no B forms for this building or the other one. So that's partly why we're kind of um, fishing around. Um, Dylan, do you have any knowledge of this building at all? I don't, I didn't have a lot of time this week and I appreciate Barbara reaching out to Nancy because that's what I thought to do. I looked a lot on the college archives website. Um, yeah, I couldn't find it on the website. Anything so on there. After. Um, <laughs> and I also checked the Sanborn maps and found the same thing that Sarah just said. It's it, There is no structure in, in the 1915, there is by 1930, so. Okay, okay. All right, um, so that's, um, a little bit of background on the building. I think that we need to, again, go back to the, um, the evidence and think about how this does or does not um, meet the criteria that we would use to determine about it being preferably preserved. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about that? Um, well, I would agree with what Barbara said. It's it's clearly over a hundred years old. It's in a prominent spot and it's connected to a, a notable family and has a long history. Okay. Um, I, well, again, looking uh, at the criteria, it, it does appear that the building is in good condition. Uh, it does appear that the building is intact. You have already addressed the age of it as being over 100 years old. Um, example of a certain period or style, don't know about that. Uh, the role in the streetscape, I think is important, um, although that is on, on the interior of the campus, but I, that I do, it does come down and um, I know another building is planned for that site. So uh, maybe the, the missing tooth will get filled in. Mm, exemplary construction elements, not clear about that. Um, does the building or structure yield, yield information important to history? I guess I would say as part of what you've identified as being connected to the earlier estate mm -hmm. um, and has it been removed from its religion or vocation? I, I, we don't know that. Right. So I would, I would say my opinion weighing in and again, looking at all the evidence that it, um, it does seem to me to be um, a significant end building and should be preferably preserved. So, um, okay. Is there any more discussion about this? Uh, Martha, I, Charlie from Smith is here as well. I don't know if he wants to make a presentation oh, or has of any. Of course. Yes, Charlie. To... And Greg, um, you're here too, our other commissioners. So Greg, you're welcome to weigh in on this. This is the eight college lane property that is slated for demolition. Charlie, I'm... do you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, I don't really uh, have a lot to offer in terms of what your decision might be. I'm not going to try to convince you either one way or the other. Um, we are in the process of designing a new building for our career services department. So, and it's um, it's a program that is um, supporting the the future careers of the students and the proximity of this site to admissions is desirable for the college and that it is um, 
informing students and, and parents that are coming onto campus that we have a, a plan for them as they leave after four years to um, continue on with their careers and we're going to assist them in that regard. And the current um, facility that we use is, is Drew Hall on Elm Street. Um, and it's just not suitable for this particular purpose. So the college has decided that it, it needs a new building, a modern building to attract um, students and also to attract uh, employers um, for these students to see that we are um, really putting women out there in the forefront for careers. And so this location is desirable. And unfortunately the building size, which is gonna be in the range of 15,000 square feet, um, it will not accommodate a college lane on the site also. So that is the main reason we're looking at yeah. having it removed. Okay. And of course, all the commissioners know that the future use of the property is not one of our um, considerations, but it's interesting to know anyway. But, but, um, but as I had said before, when we were talking about, is it seven college lane that's across the <laughs> street that's the current, um, admissions office that I was just going to urge Smith to really just consider can you use these at least the historical parts of these buildings as say a gateway to your newer building um this I know it a college lane is now I think um a, a little uh, conference room you know could it be the um the, the foyer or the some kind of entry or waiting area when people come in um and then it it flows into a, a bigger building, just to keep the historical part of it. I, I feel like, I mean, Smith is usually, I've always thought is very good about, um, you know, respecting its history and saving its history. And uh, not that things should be static in terms of building, but just that um, it seems to me that if somebody's creative, they could figure out a way to um, incorporate, again, both of those, existing buildings or at least part of the admissions office and then maybe this whole building um into the newer one and that's just what i think would would be a good solution thanks barbara um greg do you have any comments about it I, you're coming a little late but um we'd be happy to and welcome you to weigh in on this Hi, good evening, everyone. Yeah, I do apologize for being late. Um, I am not sure what jurisdiction we do have for being a uh, building inside of Smith College, but again, it's um, architectural history is important, and it kind of seems like Smith College wants to tear just about everything down and rebuild a parking lot or a new building. And um, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not happy to see a building like that go. So that's um, that's my thoughts all right thank you um any other comments from the commission okay um well i would entertain a motion from someone if they would like to um we can take this in two parts or one part uh, could, uh, could you just check for public comment if there is any sure thank you is there any public comment on this Okay, there is not. So um, I'd be happy to take a motion. Um, and again, it can be one part or two. Uh, you know, first of all, we would be voting to determine this be preferably preserved in this. And then if so, if that passes, then we would put uh, some type of a delay on it. Would anyone like to craft that motion? I, I, I'll move that we find eight college lane preferably preserved. And you said we can make the whole thing the part of one motion. I think so, right, Sarah? Then, yeah. So okay. to declare it preferably preserved and to impose up to a 12 month uh, delay, demolition delay on the property. Okay. And you're saying up to 12 months because that would give the um, applicant op opportunity to return with right. an approach okay, right. in the interim right. and shorten the delay possibly. Do, is there a second on this? I will second that. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay, Sarah, I think we're ready to take a vote. All right. So roll call vote on this one. Greg? Aye. Uh, Dylan? Yes. Barbara? Yes. And Martha? Yes. 
anything else. Okay. And then the second application is for the 15 Awaga Avenue. Am I saying that right, Awaga? I think so. Um, which is on the other side of the campus. And we did receive information about this, um, a little bit more information in the demo application, um, including a photograph of the house. And I think also you probably all received um, Sarah's excellent Google links today, which I think helped us to familiarize ourselves with these properties physically if they weren't, people weren't able to get out and see them. Um, and I already read through the evidence and um, I'd be happy to open this up for discussion. Um, does anybody have any preliminary thoughts on it, commissioners? Well, when, when I went out to, I'm on the subcommittee for determining significance. And when I did that and looked at the property, um, I think it's, it's really quite important in that streetscape. There isn't much left on that street um, and it's, um, also to the left of the property or the left of the house, there's a, a nice open space with a big tree. It, I think that abuts up to Smith's, um, it's a 30 Belmont uh, office building, I guess. Um, and um, I, I feel that, and I, I know I'm not supposed to think, oh, it's gonna be a parking lot, but I feel that the both the house and that open space, which gives a green space to that little section of neighborhood, are just, it's a very important part of the look of that neighborhood and the feel of that neighborhood. Um, you know, and more and more of these houses are disappearing. Um, so I think it would be a shame to lose that one and have the, you know, there's already a parking lot very near that to have that extended, to, to have the loss of any buildings um, ex extend to 15 Oaga. Okay, thank you. Um, Dylan, I know you said you were busy. Do you have any thoughts about the history of the building? Well, my mother and grandmother grew up on Belmont in two houses that are no longer there and are now the location of the Science Center. Um, I'm very familiar with the neighborhood. I work around the corner. Um, it's, yeah, I think it's, I, I knew the Edelsteins who lived there forever, um, certainly for my whole life and, and decades before. Um, I think it's its main importance is that it's one of the last examples of a neighborhood that once existed that was all of Belmont that stretched around the corner onto Green Street that had a number of houses and Well Smith, you know, I do think does a great job of preserving a lot of the buildings in our community. I think this neighborhood is is almost completely gone and, and I hate to see it go further. Um, so I, I would strongly urge that it should be preferably preserved. So Dylan, just out of curiosity, um, do you know what the impetus for the development of this neighborhood was? Was it related to Smith? Was it related to downtown? Was it related to the... Um, you know? I think it certainly came up more when Smith was there, but there were a lot of old houses in, in that neighborhood, certainly on West Street and, and around. Yeah. Like it filled in a lot more. And, and you know, Arnold Avenue is, an, is another one that used to be full of many houses. It, it's pretty much just radiating out from this this side of town. And uh, yeah, so I, I do think a lot of history has been lost and I'd hate, I'd hate to see this one, which looks to be, having walked around it and having seen it, it looks to be in very good shape. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have any bearing on our decision, but it sold for a hefty amount recently and uh, clearly is a, is a nice property. And it was built, do we know when it was built? Yeah, it, it also made its first appearance on the 1930 map. Let me double check something. Um, yeah, I feel it, like it's, it's shown as a lot on the 1915 map, and then the structure itself appears on the 1930 map. I, I think it's right around 1916 when we first see a couple of families, and I think those first few years, some of the families change. I didn't see any connection to Smith in those early families. So it's sort of like a classic four square design, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, Greg, do you have any thoughts about it? Well, I think public records said it was built at 1900. 
So um, in that time frame, but I agree with Dylan and um, the other speaker that it does have a uh, historical significance to that area. A lot of those houses are no longer um, are being demolished into uh, Smith College uh, buildings. And I'd like to see that this one at least be preserved why Smith College thinks about as better options than tearing it down. Okay. Uh, Charlie, would you like to weigh in on this at all? Or at least provide any additional information? Um, I don't know that I can provide you a lot of inf more additional information on it. Um, uh, I think that it's been about, well, I've been here for 30 years and it's been almost that amount of time that I think Smith has been doing master plans, which have um, mostly all of them have concluded that if the college is to grow, it's going to be in the direction of this particular neighborhood. And I know that Ford Hall, that, that came to the surface fairly clear, clearly. Um, and that we do have agreements with the city to um, accommodate housing stock in that area, I think, as part of the Ford Agreement. So we will look at that, dust it off, um, to make sure that we maintain uh, affordable housing in Northampton. And I think um, this particular residence might fall into that category. So, so what does that actually mean, Charlie? I, I mean, I think I know what I'm, it meant with Ford Hall, but go ahead. I'm not sure what it means, honestly. I think I've heard talk of uh, uh, Smith contributing to a fund for affordable housing or something like that to be created elsewhere to accommodate this. But we are hemmed in um, by uh, our perimeter. And if there is a desire to grow um, the college. I mean, we're a victim of our own success, perhaps. Um, and there's not many places we can do that. Um, and this uh, neighborhood is, has been, you know, there's no question since Mendenhall Center back in the 60s, um, houses have been going um, as the college expands its footprint. Um, so it's an unfortunate reality uh, for Smith College that it is expanding. So when you say grow, are you, is the college, I'm just curious, is college planning on like um, increasing their, their student population or just um, like their offerings to students? We aren't decreasing population as was anticipated a few years back. Um, we started reducing square footage that is no longer the case when i don't know if you remember we took parsons house offline um a while back and then um opened it again to provide uh housing for students that were close to the library renovation um so that house we thought we had closed it and would eventually do something different with it but um since that time the college has changed its course so it's not going to reduce enrollment um and in fact it's the demand for enrollment at Smith is, is kind of causing us to, to continue to at least maintain the status quo. Um, so in terms of why we're expanding in this particular location, I think it is a desire to make the campus more pedestrian friendly, uh, to reduce car pedestrian uh, conflicts on campus and try to relocate if it does become parking, parking to the periphery of the campus um, to maintain some of the uh, uh, try to reduce the number of car trips into campus, into central campus. Okay. Yeah. So it, I'm just, I mean, it doesn't we seem like- We don't have an area place. for like a large surface lot that's in the vicinity of the campus. So we're trying to yeah. relocate parking where we can. Obviously we have issues at eight college lane with a parking lot that's 20 spaces. Those are not going to be able to remain there. Um, so we have some work to do. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think of Smith as, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this, but having a ton of interior parking at all, it doesn't well, seem like Dickinson much. Well, Dickinson lot is a fairly large one. It's in a sensitive location. As you remember, Dickinson House used to be there at one time, which was the student residence, and that was lost in a fire, I believe. And mm. uh, as a result of that, um, it turned into open space and eventually parking. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a fairly important central campus location, Dickinson parking lot. And I think as people approach the campus, they come in from different directions, but Green Street is a fairly popular way to access the campus. And mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. we're doing is showing them our front door is a parking lot. So that may eventually want to be considered as the green space or a future um, location for something else. Okay, so, but, but yeah, but that's sort of like one of the only big lots like that in the campus, right? I mean, 
Um, just thinking. This earth lot is fairly good size. Um, ITT lot is fairly big. Um, what else? Uh, we have some. Um, uh, I think over in the Henshaw area, we already have quite a bit of parking in that vicinity. Cutters is going and more planned, right? Morgan Hall. It's really spread out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was all from just curiosity. Okay. Does anybody in the uh, member, uh, members of the public that are on have a comment? Is it Lucy? Hi, everyone. Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. So um, I am in the apartment that is directly to the right, facing Sally and High's place um, on Awaga Avenue. So um, we are in um, at um, 11, nine, nine, nine Awaga nine, nine. Avenue. Um, and so we are really, you know, we knew Sally and I before they moved. Um, and we knew when they moved out of the house that the house would be um, go up for sale. And it sounded like when we were talking to their daughter, Carolyn, that it never even made it to market, that um, they worked a deal out with Smith. Um, um, and it never went to, um, like I said, to, to the market. So we were kind of holding out hopes that perhaps the family would move into this house. It's a beautiful location. There's a beautiful green right next to it. Um, and when we saw the demolition sign um, come up just the other day, we really wanted to join this call because we were really terrified of this house coming down. It's a beautiful structure. It's, I mean, it's situated in just a beautiful part of the street. Um, I know that folks on this call have already talked about this neighborhood slowly sort of um, houses being scooped up um, to the college and um, you know there's an apartment right across the street from us it's a green apartment building um, and it's been rotting for years at the base and I don't see a lot of it being well kept up it's and it's a Smith owned building and while I'm it's exciting to hear that Smith is looking for plans to grow and I do want the college to be successful and thrive in that way. Um, I do have concerns about Smith, the upkeep for these, for these sorts of houses and these apartments. Um, and it would just be a terrible loss to our street, to the streetscape, um, if this became a parking lot. Um, and I know that parking is limited on campus, um, but it would just be a huge shame to have this part of the street be taken up by something like that. Um, I'm just like super passionate about it, as is my partner. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think that's it. Yeah, it's just um, when, like I said, when they sold it and when it went, it was just, we've just been everyone on the street who is um, a resident. The, the house to our right um, is, I think, the last sort of building that belongs to the owner. Um, yeah, our property and the property next to us is the only non-Smith owned property yeah, on this land. So, so I think that we're kind of all holding our breath a little bit, and um, which is why we wanted to join this call to kind of really advocate for it to not be taken away from the street. Um, and we've gone into that house and it's, you know, it's a beautiful home. So anything else? No, that's it. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Well, thank you, Lucy. That's um, thank a good you information all. for us to have. Okay, um, I don't I don't have too much more to add from my review of this. Um, again, it seems similar to the A College Lane in that it looks like it's in good condition. It's intact. Um, we know it's historic. Um, the four square style, you know, certainly indication of that period. Um, we heard about the role of the streetscape in the streetscape. Um, the information about history that it yields is clearly important. Um, don't believe the building's been removed or um, was designed by a famous or local architect. So I guess um, I would be in alignment with everyone else. So um, are there other, any other comments? And if not, um, I would entertain a motion to either um, two step one you know first to determine this to be preferably preserved second step to put a delay on it on the demolition or do it all in one step whoever wants to make the motion gets that choice i would move that we uh, vote to determine that 15 Owaga avenue is preferably preserved and impose up to a 12 months demolition delay on the property thank you 
I will second that motion. Thank you, Greg. Okay, any more discussion? Okay, I think we're ready to vote. All right, so roll call on this one, Greg? Yes. Dylan? Yes. Barbara? Yes. And Martha? Yes. Unanimous. And, and Charlie, you know that uh, the terms of that, if the college um, can come up with an alternative before 12 months are over from the time you submitted your demo application, um, we'd be happy to entertain those alternatives and shorten the delay if appropriate. Understood, thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, the next item on the agenda is how appropriate, the demolition review subcommittee. Uh, we have lost one of our members. There are three of three members and um, Harvey was one of them. And we have this on the agenda just, just because we need to fill that slot and someone needs to volunteer to do that. <laughs> And so, Steve, yeah, I mean, I would love for you to volunteer to do that, but I have a feeling a lot of demolition applications are going to be coming from your conflict. <laughs> Am I right? That's the way it seems like it's going down that track right now. Yeah, that is the one, the one issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just quick overview of the subcommittee. So unlike most types of subcommittees, this one doesn't meet. So every time a demolition application is received by the building department, uh, I, I send an email uh, to the members of the subcommittee. They have 15 days to respond, you, but a quicker response is much appreciated for those demolitions that everybody agrees uh, can proceed. Um, you know, dem demo contractors and homeowners appreciate the, the speediness. Um, so, you know, going out, reviewing any information that we might have and rendering an opinion as to whether it's, um, it meets the criteria for significance, in which case a hearing, just like the one that we the two that we just had is scheduled, or if it's not significant, in which case demo can proceed. And and two of three votes is enough to, like in, in an instance where Stephen had to recuse himself from. Yep. And the, the chair is sort of ex officio if two people have a conflict or uh, can't participate for some reason, but that's never happened to my memory. So um, does, any, does any, Steve, would you like to volunteer? Or do you feel like you're just gonna be in too much conflict and, and the situation that was just outlined is not gonna work, be workable for you? Um, well, I don't know how many more future proposals there might be. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, I don't wanna say anything about that. Um, but I'm happy to I'm happy to serve on the committee and try to be try to be useful. So and if it means I have to recuse myself, sometimes that's that's okay. And I think as Dylan points out, we could we could work through that. Um, I'm always happy to do a little digging in a uh, you know arch archives and field visits. That's like my scholarly work. So I'm I'm down for that kind of local history research anytime. Yeah, and you know, unfortunately, um, it feels like we've had a lot of these in at least the last year. It feels like I don't know, I would have to go back and look, but we've had a lot of demo applications and I, I don't, we don't know whether that's gonna kind of continue, but it feels like it's sort of a trend at the moment. And um, yeah, I was just know. gonna say that I was, I've been thinking about this a lot lately too. And I wonder um, if it would be useful and I'm happy being the person raising the point, I'm happy to also volunteer for this task and it might take a few months, but I, I think it would be interesting, especially if the consultants on the preservation plan are not looking at this question to just do a, a kind of review of one year worth or a year and a half, just sort of where are they now kind of situation, um, just sort of um, some updates and, and check in. Because I often wonder after we have our discussion, kind of what's the, what's the status, what's happening, um, how many have there been, where are they, you know. Um, and maybe we, maybe we only need to do that once a year or every three years or something, but it seems yeah, like we um I do maintain a a running tally of those with updates as I know about them. Um, and I can send everybody the link to that. Oh, most, that would be great. Most yeah, of the the vast majority of these have come down for torn down. Yeah, and the um yeah, 
I just think it, yeah, it would be it would be interesting, and I, maybe just some simple counting too as to like how many and is yeah. it is it more and than in the past? That, that okay. definitely will be included in the preservation plan as well. Oh, great! And okay. I'm I'm excited to see what the recommendations for approaching mm -hmm. demolition in a different way might be because yeah. this, you know even just looking at the numbers, this hasn't been a spectacularly successful ordinance. Yeah, and I think as most most of my fellow commissioners know, right the way to um, think about that proactively from preservation planning perspective is to make sure you know what the resources are and then seek designation, right? The designation, especially local, really only local <laughs> designation protects um, buildings. So, um, so And then yeah. also to provide incentives if possible, you know, for preserving the buildings right. that are most important. Right. Public, yeah, and I think there's, yeah, that sort of um, public understanding, public discussion, um, that sort of thing. And lots of ways in which um, public exposure, public discussion saves buildings too, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, well, thank you, Steve. That would be great. So. Yeah, yeah, so just let me know. Is it, so it's sort of like on an ad hoc basis as they come in, then you um, let, okay, great. Yeah, I'm happy to help. Um, one other item that I meant to mention, this was included in our package for the meeting today, tonight, um, there is going to be a meeting of the Western Massachusetts Historical Commission Coalition, which is essentially a um, loosely organized, um, I, well, I shouldn't speak for the organizers, but um, it's a uh, just an entity that was set up to kind of get historical commissions um, in the Western part of the state together to talk about issues that they share and what they're doing. Um, and there has been one um, scheduled for Thursday, April 20th at 10 a.m. It's virtual, so you could do it on Zoom. And um, I'm I'm gonna try to do this. I think it would be really um, helpful to just see what other commissions are going through and what the issues are that they face. And um, maybe we'll get some new ideas too. So please look at that. It was in your mailing, your emailing. Um, and I believe that's it, unless there's any other agenda item that um, people would want I'd to, like bring to bring up. I'd like to bring up, yeah. actually, it's two things. One of them is really brief. And that is whether, I, I, maybe at our last meeting, we discussed whether we might have a vote again um, as to whether or not we'd start meeting in person instead of virtually. Right. Yes. We certainly can do that. I know, Steve, you were particularly interested in it. I just would give you, there's one caveat from me. <laughs> I broke my leg a month ago. Oh, and, no. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm pretty immobile. Um, I'm not going to be up and around for another couple months. So well, well, we I can prefer doing that. There. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. I prefer doing them virtually um, mm -hmm. since March, April, probably through May. I think June, real, realistically, I could get back on my feet again, I hope. Okay. Um, so if that works for folks and they're comfortable with that, I'm happy to shoot for like the June or June meeting. Sarah, do they have hybrid capabilities in either of the meeting rooms we've used in the past? We do. Uh, so either I, I know council chambers has it and it works fairly well. Um, I don't know if anyone's done a hybrid meeting from the hearing room yet, but that capability should exist. Okay. So that it's basically that. Um, well, there's a couple of different ways to do it, depending on um, the court's pleasure. But, you know, people could watch the meeting, but not be able to participate um, because, it, you know, it can be really challenging to try and monitor public comment on a screen and also in person. Um, but there is some capability to have some interaction as well. Okay. So, Sarah, for the joint meeting of the planning board and the commission, would that be um, hybrid? That would be hybrid, yeah. So okay. uh, the pla planning board is meeting in person. I know that, yeah. But um, but they are taking public comment uh, for, I think they're doing it at the beginning of the meeting and then uh, just for public hearings in a, a pretty regimented way. Okay. Uh, but, so we're, that, but that one would be hybrid. Okay, so the is a joint meeting um, we would be more than just public comment because we're the other party to that meeting, correct? Yeah, I, and I'll have to check with Barrett about okay. the logistics of that, but more to come, certainly. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, 
So the second thing I wanted to bring up relates to the Memorial Park in Village Hill. And I think Sarah, you were away when this was happening. I may have sent you some emails about this. And I think Martha, I sent one to you as well. That, um, because I think we all know that this very large beech tree fell. Um, and um, uh, Laurie Sanders and from Historic Northampton and, and the people from the Village Hill Tenants Association were in communication because they thought that there might, people at Village Hill might be interested in purchasing sections of the tree or having something done with it. So they managed to, a Bartlett, a Bartlett tree service took the tree down and cut it up uh, in fairly big pieces. And this guy, Jay, whose last name I can't remember, who has a sawmill and actually he has portable sawmill too, but a lot of pieces were taken to his place. Um, and then they were gonna figure out, well, how do we, how do people get them? And so I asked for a very large, for a large section to be put aside, possibly to be used as a pedestal in the park to mount the sign on that would list our donors. And a line could be added at the bottom of all the donors names saying that this sign is, this plaque is mounted on a portion of one of the beech trees that stood in front of Old Main. And I do know someone who could finish it, you know, either smooth it off a bit, I don't know whether you could seal it at all. It's also possible we would just put it there and, you know, pretty big chunk like that might last for quite a while. And if, if and when it ever rotted out, we'd do something else with it or somebody else would do something else with that sign. But it just seemed to me a really nice thing to have preserve a piece of that trunk of that beach on that site and use it for a pedestal. So I wanted to know how people felt about that. Oh, well, I think, I mean, that's, I like the idea. I'm a, I'm a little concerned about the longevity of wood, especially if the plaque is um, bronze or something like that. Um, Cause you have to, you know, you have to, um, you know, drill into it and that yeah. drilling into wood creates us, you know, a, a, a weak point. Um, so. At the, sorry, at the moment, I think that sign was planned to be not, Bronze. I thought it was going to be like the other signs that are there. Okay. I don't know whether it's possible just to adhere it onto that. Maybe you wouldn't mm -hmm. have to screw it in. I don't know. So I don't know whether that's better for the tree or. Um... Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying. To... A, a metal plaque had really been cost prohibitive, so we were looking at right. Yeah, so we were yeah, looking at fossil, same, you know. same type of material from fossil graphics, but it still would have to be, you know, adhered with mounting yeah. screws or right. something to to go. In, into the trunk itself right so yeah I mean I don't think that's it's an it's a lovely idea to reuse the beach um somehow and I'm just trying to think if there are other things that we could do there that would be um you know equally um you know might last a bit longer um that you wouldn't have to you know um weekend by by inserting something on. Um, mm -hmm. So let's give it th some thought. Does, does the decision have to be made soon? Uh, I don't know. I'll contact this okay. guy, Jay, and ask him, or the people at the um, Tenants Association and see where we stand. Mm -hmm. I okay. haven't gone any farther on that. Okay, well, th I think that's a great idea. And let's just all think about uh, some, maybe some other uses and if people have a chance to go up there, does every Greg and Steve, you're new. Do you know where this is up on Village Hill? Um, yeah, a little. And I was actually, um, well, one thought is that, you know, seating is always nice, depending on what the design is for the place. So that's the first idea that comes to mind. Um, but then the other was just uh, kind of wonder. I have lots and bits and pieces of the mass development, redevelopment, 30 year long master planning process there but not a good sense of where kind of cultural heritage issues fit in. Is there, is there like an MOU or something? Or is it like part of a development agreement for some historical interpretation as mitigation? Or what's the context under which this stuff is happening? Barbara, Sarah, you know. Um... And if that's the beyond the scope of this call, I'm happy. <laughs> no, the, park, the park was created um, 
as, as part of the memorandum of understanding for development of the hospital and mass development had to provide a space for it. And then there was a memorial committee and there were some commission members on it, but initially it wasn't, it was connected to the um, citizen citizen's advisory, advisory committee. committee, committee or commission, committee. And later the historical commission took over the responsibility for this park, um, but basically after it was established. So the park is essentially done. We just, we still do have to get this donor plaque on site. Um, and um, this is where the fountain is and the three. Yeah, it's where the fountain is, right. So the Oleander yeah. Drive. Yeah, and, um, and, I, I've uh, taken students to look at the, you know, we tell the story and we look at photos and then we'll go and and look at the park and look at the interpretive signs. So, right. Um, OK. And now all of them are up throughout the whole uh, former camp, former hospital campus. Um, and there are two two uh, um, metal benches there. Uh, doesn't mean I, I'm sort of I'm hesitant with. Uh, using the wood for uh, seating just because the, the the bench that was at the um, burial grounds, you know, we went through three or four benches and they just rotted. I mean, they just, mm -hmm. so I, you know, it's possible there could still be something, you know, created out of this wood there. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's some way. Is it city owned land? Yes. Yes. Okay. Interesting, so. Okay. Well, thank you for the backstory. Sorry to. <laughs> yeah, and Steve, the larger interp the ter larger interpretive effort there. So you said that you saw the signs in the park, but there are more. Um, that is being well, Barbara, you're involved in that. Um, and then Tom Riddell. Do you know Tom, who is an emeritus professor from Smith? I know of some of his work and students who have worked with him, but we have never met. Okay. Well, he's done a Herculean job, really pulling. Yeah, he did a tremendous job. His students, Go ahead, Barbara. his students came up with a walking tour for during one of his first year seminars, and then uh, we we had Betty Sharp, who was one of the co-directors of Historic Northampton and public historian. She helped us really hone the texts for these for the plaques. I mean, for the signs that are throughout the village and matching up photographs with them. So she was really involved with that also. Yeah. Um, and was the National Register District delisted? Were there any other follow-up like that? I don't or think it's, it's, it's been delisted, even though no. all but okay. four buildings are gone. I mean, it's pretty rare. I mean, delisting is actually really rare. <laughs> it almost never happens, but um, it's, it's still it listed. A real, it doesn't, there's not much still left, it, even though there's nothing there. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's a real bone of contention, I think, because we, um, I worked on the park also, and we tried to get money from the state to um preserve the fountain mm. and they <laughs> it's for, through mass historical we tried to get it through mass historical and they de did determine that it wasn't eligible because the you know the district had kind of you know lost integrated that whole argument about integrity yeah right and um it was developers you know, had had the wasn't same mass historical with, well, but it was a state yeah. was the one who let this place fall apart so it's like you mm. they put us in a very bad very bad position. And so. developers ran into the same issue with historic tax credits for some of the few remaining buildings as well. Mm -hmm. They were um, proposing projects that would have really preserved those and weren't able to get any uh, tax credits for those for the same yeah. reason. Yeah, so that's really bad. You know, we I think the city was really caught up and I don't know what agencies were feuding, but it was really too bad because it suffered in the long run, but that's okay. We made the best of it, right, Barbara? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we made the best. Well, I was really excited about this beach tree, but uh, maybe I'll just try and figure out something else to do with it. Well, let me get some thought. Yeah. Um, think about it. The problem with, you know, unless you're using like a tropical hardwood or um, one of the newer woods that are composites that have been, mm -hmm. you know, engineered right, right. to really last, um, these, uh, you know, woods that are. Well, the beaches that that wasn't an American beach; it was a European beach. But anyway, beaches are not, you know, they're not going to last right. exposed outside very long. So, um, okay, yeah. All right. Uh, anything else? Anybody had anything they wanted to bring up? Barbara, is that are you, are you done with your list? That was it. Those are the two okay. points. I have. Yeah. Do you have anything else? 
Um, just one quick question for Sarah, whether there's any updates from our consultant on the preservation plan. No, I think they, uh, because we don't have a strict end of fiscal year timeline, I think they may have been diverted to other projects. They they sent only one very, very small invoice, so I don't think there's been much progress since then, okay. but I, I will check in with them Okay. to see where things stand. Dylan, any? And Greg, any other? I am okay. good. All right. I will entertain a motion to adjourn, and we'll see you at the end of April. Okay. All right. All right.